There is only one railroad in the last 50 years which has impacted the running on the Northeast Corridor this much. It's a railroad that has slowly dragged and modernized passenger travel across America using new engines and coaches, turning a depressing form of travel to one that could easily match the airlines. It's all aboard Amtrak for, for today's video as we go through the initial electric locomotives for Amtrak such as a GG1 and the brand new but disappointing E60 locomotives and briefly touch on the iconic Metroliner train. My name is Jamie and if you're interested in these sorts of videos do give this video a like and subscribe as it helps out a lot. Next week's video will be about British Railways AC electrification from 1955 to 1967, exploring the early development of why they chose AC and how they planned electrification in the grand scheme of things. So tune in next week to find out more. The story of Amtrak begins in the early 1960s. In the early 1960s, passenger travel by rail was quickly dropping in quality, schedules and increasing in pricing. This was also being exacerbated by the increases of highway travel and by increased competition from the airlines. All the major railroads were trying to rid themselves of this responsibility of moving passengers around America by rail. The Doyle Report proposed that private railroads group their passenger services into one single entity. Proposals will be made in 1965 and in 1968. Even direct funding into pilot programs such as the Metroliner and Turbotrain from the government itself failed to address the cost of running passenger trains in general. Penn Central's bankruptcy on June 21, 1970 would cause Penn Central to discontinue 34 of their original passenger trains. This was a very big problem and in October 1970, Congress would immediately pass the Rail Passenger Services Act as a response to this ongoing crisis. As part of the act, it allowed funding for the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, NRPC for short. This was a publicly owned company that received taxpayer funding and would operate intercity trains. Most people believed that this project would not be profitable and would most likely be canned within a few years of its starting. At first, a draft of 27 specific routes would be chosen. These routes would be chosen to allow the corporation to hopefully make a profit by 1975. President Richard Nixon and the Office of Management and Budget believed that was too optimistic and the cut draft was cut down to 16 routes. This was publicly showcased and the 16 route solution was very unpopular. By January 28, 1971, the final draft would be completed and in total there would now be 21 routes in total. Increase of 5 over the original. In the background, NRPC was also going a rebrand changing from the original name of Railpax to now the very famous Amtrak. Amtrak would begin on May 1st, 1971. Amtrak had to start from scratch. They would have to purchase 286 E and F units and 30 GG ones to begin with, but they would soon expand their fleet. One important thing to think at this time was that Amtrak didn't contain any trackage or anything like that. That would come much later in 1976 with Amtrak inheriting the Northeast Corridor. Amtrak would also order some new locomotives as the current lot of passenger diesels was starting to get old and becoming overall more expensive to run. These new locomotives would include the General Electric E60 electric locomotive the EMD STP40F and the GE P30CH. These locomotives would all be a failure in one way or another. Amtrak would be given a mandate to reverse the decline of passenger travel. On the Northeast Corridor, 
passenger trains were being pulled by either a GG1 that was built in 1936 or would use a new but unreliable Metroliner trains. Metroliners would be able to put out the speeds wanted by Amtrak but suffered from a poor readiness rate and were prone to failure during service. In comparison, the GG1s were reliable were already more than 35 years old at this point and would be speed restricted to 85 kilometers per hour initially. Amtrak was given two choices, rebuild the GG1s at a very high cost or replace them with brand new locomotives. In a weird turn of affairs, General Electric already had an electric locomotive design that was perfect for Amtrak and it was already within a delivery date of within one year. This was better than the alternative of importing a European design and adapting it to the American conditions as would take three years or more to get the design rolling. The E60C was originally an electric locomotive designed for the Black Mesa and Lake Powell Railroad. It was designed to haul coal from the mines to the power plant and due to this the E60 would use two three axle trucks. The locomotive would convert the AC overhead with thyristors to DC for the DC traction motors. The E60Cs would have 6,000 horsepower and a starting effort of 125,000 pounds force. To adapt the E60C to passenger use, the wheels would be downsized from the original 42 inches to 40 inches. Gearing would also be changed to allow it to travel up to 120 miles per hour. As a downside of the increased top speed, it would have a lower starting tractive effort of 75,000 pounds. To increase flexibility, the Amtrak E60s would be fitted on with cabs on both ends, unlike the freight dedicated E60C, which has a single cab. One equipment that was crucial for passenger travel that needed to be fitted was a train heating system. Due to the mixture of rolling stock Amtrak use, so which was the older steam heated passenger cars and the newer electrically heated passenger cars such as the Amfleet coaches. Two different variations would be created for Amtrak. The steam heated E60 would be known as the E60CP and the HEP generator fitted E60 which will be later known as the E60CH. Amtrak would order 15 on March 26, 1973 and 11 more on October 12, 1973. After the original 26, 15 would be fitted with steam generators and 11 with head and power. This ratio would actually be changed as orders for Amfleet cars would be increased. This would now mean that only 6 of the original 26 would now be fitted with steam heaters. The hope was that the E60s could replace the older GG1 fleet and the disappointing Metroliners in the long term. The E60s would begin to arrive in November 1974. The E60s would be painted in the original Amtrak Phase 2 livery and would be the first to receive it. Straight away, there would be massive issues with the locomotives. The locomotives would noticeably swing side to side while accelerating. This yawing would actually damage the rail seriously. During testing, on February 24th, 1975, the E60 would suffer a serious derailment while traveling at 105 miles per hour. During investigations, it revealed that the truck design was incredibly faulty. A response to this, the FRA would restrict the top speed of the E60s to 85 miles per hour, the same as the GG1s. Amtrak publicly announced that they had confidence in the E60s being fixed. However, in the background, a new reality was being drawn up. A tender would be drawn up for the replacements of the E60s, if things weren't going to go well. As a possibility that the E60s couldn't be fixed, 
and that the Metroliners would still be extremely unreliable even with the rebuilding program, a new locomotive had to be developed to face this possibility. Amtrak would invite French builder Alstom and Swedish builder Acer to this test program to see if they would be suitable as a base for a future high-speed electric locomotive. Alstom would bring the dual voltage CC21000 that was in use with the French National Railway Company NSCF. ASA would bring the RC4 that was in use with the Swedish State Railway SJ. The RC4 would be designated as X995 and the CC21000 would be designated as X996 during the Amtrak test. The CC21000 X996 would be first built for the SNCF in 1969 as a high horsepower dual voltage electric locomotive. The single volt dedicated locomotives similar to this class would be named the CC6500. Both classes would have 8000 horsepower and would be incredibly quick. It would have a top speed of 120 miles per hour. However, before it arrived in the US of A, it would have to be modified for the tests. These modifications would include new pilot beams, a new coupler pocket for knuckle couplers, a new transformer that weighed 2.5 tons more than the original, and Amtrak cab signaling and speed control. What was most important out of all of this was that the labels and the manuals had to be English instead of French. Sessions X996 was capable of getting up to speed. However, its suspension was unable to cope with the Northeast Corridor's track geometry. This was due to the SNCF having generally a much higher quality overall for track. Due to the design of the X996, it was limited in terms of suspension travel reducing its ability in being able to soak up the bad trackage easier. However, concerns by Alstom staff regarding the substandard track quality in comparison to the SNCF was voiced before the locomotive even ran. X996 would be only run between March 1977 and April 1977. Amtrak concluded that the X996 was not able to meet their needs. However, Alstom and SNCF argued that the locomotive was perfectly fine, but the condition of the track was a real problem. Both parties was right in their opinion. The Northeast Corridor was undermaintained for years and had only started to receive the necessary funding and care it needed for maintaining good quality track. X996 was only designed for good quality track that was used in France and was never expected to go through the rough riding quality that was found on the Northeast Corridor at the time. X996 would be returned to France where it would serve until 1995 where it was converted to the single voltage CC6500 series numbered 6577. It would continue service until it was withdrawn and scrapped in 2005, serving over 35 years for the SNCF. In comparison, the Swedish had their own locomotive for this test, named 995 and SJRC4. It would hit the ground running, impressing Amtrak staff at the time, being able to do what the French locomotive couldn't, handle the Northeast Corridor. The locomotive would have no fault overall, while it would have less power and less tractive effort compared to the French locomotive, it was the right tool for the right job. The Swedish RC4 would be chosen as the basis for a new future locomotive to replace Amtrak's earlier mistakes, and to hopefully retire the aging GG1 fleet. However, we'll talk about this new future locomotive in another video for the time. The GG1s would have served for nearly 30 years by the time Amtrak got their hands on them. Amtrak would actually initially start with 30 GG1s, purchased at $50,000 each, and would lease 21 more from Penn Central. 
At first, this would have a basic paint scheme of pure black with Amtrak written on the side. Due to their age, the E60s would be purchased as a way to retire these old locomotives. However, due to the faulty nature of the E60s, the GG1s would preserve until the replacement for the E60s would finally arrive in the form of the AEM7s in 1980. They would quickly replace the GG1s in Amtrak service with the final Amtrak GG1 service being on April 26, 1980. The Metroliner project was a project inherited by Amtrak from Penn Central who inherited from the Pennsylvania Railroad which was in collaboration with the Department of Transport. Its intentions were simple, create an electric multiple unit that could travel at high speeds rivaling those of the Japanese Shinkansen. While the goal was ambitious initially, it was able to meet the speeds required in testing. Where it failed was being reliable. Issues with acceleration and readiness rate were so low that it caused Amtrak to lose faith in the program. However, one good thing that came out of it was the Amfleet coaches. If you are wanting to find more about the Metroliner train, I have made a video about it and there will be a link in the description to learn more about the Metroliners. So that's all we have for today. I'll be definitely going more into the AEM7s and its other replacement, the ALP44, and just explore a little bit more about how Amtrak improves for the future on the Northeast Corridor with new locomotives and even exploring some of their own the Turboliner. For your continued support and it's seriously appreciated. I'm like I can always make content that you guys watch and enjoy. So I hope to see you at next week's video about Brin's early electrification. Don't forget to like this video. I just want to say thank you from me, my partner, and my pet rabbit, Mr. Morris. Thank you and have a good night.